Hello, welcome to Apes Chapter 19 uh, Lecture Video Part 4. This is the end of our chapter. So let's begin. We're going to talk about fossil fuel emissions. Well, emissions are generally things that are released, in this case, in the form of gases. So emissions are gases that are released. Um, from fossil fuel combustion, let's talk about what is released and what it can do. So let's begin. Combust, combusting coal, burning coal. Well, burning coal, well, we talked about in an earlier chapter in the oceans chapter. Well, where did the mercury come from that happens to biomagnify in those food chains? For example, those fish at the higher levels in the food chain have high levels of mercury. Well, where did that mercury come from? It came from burning coal, burning fossil fuels, extracting fossil fuels. This mercury made its way in the oceans that way. That is what it is believed. All right. Cancer causing substances, hydrocarbons that are released from burning fossil fuels, um, volatile organic compounds that are released. All these things are dangerous to humans. Hydrogen sulfide is also released when um, from crude oil and hydrogen sulfide is a poison. It's, it's toxic to us. Um, power plants, if they're burning coal, they're releasing sulfur dioxide. When you're burning um, anything, for the most part, any fossil fuel, you're probably going to be creating some nitrogen oxides. These nitrogen oxides can lead to smog, not only acid precipitation, but they can lead to smog. So sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides both lead to acid precipitation. These nitrogen oxides lead to smog also. Carbon dioxide emissions, these are the driving force for climate change. So the big one, carbon dioxide, because there's so much of it being released. Anytime you combust or burn something, one of the products of that reaction is carbon dioxide. It could be other things like carbon monoxide. You can release sulfur dioxides, nitrogen oxides. But the main product of any burning reaction is going to be carbon dioxide. So you take something organic made out of carbon, you set it on fire, you react it with O2 oxygen, and the carbon and the oxygens react and form carbon dioxide as, a, as an emitted product. The, once again, this is the driving force to climate change. Clean coal. Well, you're going to hear the term clean all the time when you're talking about fossil fuels. It's sort of the industry's way of saying, hey, we, we can do it better. We figured out how to make it clean. Well, what does clean mean? Clean means reducing some of these uh, emissions, having less CO2 being released or not releasing sulfur or releasing less of it. So when they use the term clean, they're generally referring to things that are releasing less of these, of these emissions. How did they do that? Well, there's different techniques or equipment that they can use to do this. Air scrubbers, our devices, basically what they do is they can pull air through a machine. It's like a vacuum. It pulls air through this machine. And the air that it's pulling through, that air can basically react. In some cases, scrubbers will use minerals. For example, calcium can re react with the sulfur dioxide that's released from a smokestack uh, of a uh, coal burning plant. And it can form calcium sulfate. And calcium sulfate is called gypsum. And gypsum is used in drywall, so they actually use it in the drywall industry. They recycle that material. That's one way that an air scrubber could work. Another way an air scrubber could work, they'll, they'll use chemical reactions to strip away some of these nitrogen oxides that are produced during the, uh, the reactions. And these nitrogen oxides, what they do is they break them down into nitrogen and water. Um, also, coal. Coal can be dried. Well, what does that mean? Well, coal has water in it naturally which means in order to, to use a, a power plant, in order to burn coal and power plant, you got to set the coal on fire. So if coal has a high content of water in it, it will take more energy to set it on fire, which means you'll, and to, more energy means more burning of something else, which means more CO2 being released in the air as a result of just trying to set it on fire. So drying out coal, which means it would require less energy to set it on fire. And if it has less moisture in it, it'll actually burn hotter. And if it burns hotter, it will be able to um, convert more water to steam uh, more efficiently. So by drying coal, um, it makes coal cleaner because it requires less energy to ignite it, basically. And when it is ignited, it will be burning hotter, so it'll be more efficient. Um, some coal is converted to a, a syngas or synthesis gas. 
Um, what do they do? It, they react it with oxygen and steam at high temperatures, and it, and it converts it into pretty much like a natural gas, right? Well, these processes cost money. So clean technologies in general, if they're being used, they, the energy return on your investment goes down, which, necess, which a lot of these companies do not want that to happen. That, that cuts into their cost and their bottom, bottom, you know, their bottom line. They'll, they'll have to incur costs as a result of that energy return on investment dropping. Carbon capture and storage. Here's what's being done. I believe in Germany, um, there's a plant in Germany that is doing this. Uh, what do they do? Well, they capture the carbon dioxide that's released. And then under high pressure, they liquefy it. And then they pump it back in underground. Uh, where are they pumping it into? Areas where they probably remove natural gas from those areas anyway. So they're putting the carbon dioxide in these in these um, geological formations underground where natural gas or, or, or fossil fuels are already extracted. Sometimes they say they can pump it back into the ocean. You can store it in the ocean, but that's not necessarily a good thing because that'll just make the oceans more acidic. All right? It's not... It's too unproven at the moment. It's not used widely. Um, only some places around the world, a few places around the world are trying to use it. Now, external costs. Let's define what's an external cost. Well, the whole process of extracting fossil fuels and burning fossil fuels, um, that process, someone's making money through that process. And so a business is making money. And some people are affected by uh, the, the business of fossil fuels. So they are bearing a cost and they're not even involved in the transactions. So let me give you an example. You live in a place, you live in Oklahoma, you live in a place where all of a sudden they decide to extract natural gas on the, on the properties around where you live. You now have the potential of your area where you live, that area now has the potential of being polluted, heavily polluted due to the hydraulic fracturing that's taking place where you live. You are now paying a cost, water pollution, air pollution, if you get ill, medical expenses. By the way, these these wells, these situ they dry up eventually, which means the area is left bare after a while, and then environmental cleanup comes into play. Um, all this can lead to long-term damage, climate change, all the CO2 we've already done. So people are paying costs, external costs, and they're not even making the money in these business transactions. That's what an external cost is. Um, what does the United States government do? Our government keeps the cost of oil or fossil fuels in general low. How do they do that? They take our taxpayer money and they subsidize these different corporations that are involved in the fossil fuel industry. So what do they do? They give them tax breaks. That would be a subsidy. They can give them money. They actually give them money and say, keep the cost of fossil fuels at this price. Or keep, the, and, the, and by the way, subsidies aren't only in fossil fuels. They're just the most heavily subsidized sector in the United States. The agricultural industry does this too. You pay the farmers money. It keeps the cost of milk low. It keeps the cost of eggs low. Makes everybody happy. Consumers are happy about it. So government subsidizes fossil fuels to keep the cost of gas low. Because when the cost of gas gets too high, people are mad. They're not happy. It affects economics. It affects how much money people are able to spend. So government subsidizes things. Some of you can get subsidies for college. Um, subsidies are nice because that, that's grant money. They're giving you money for college. So you can have your college expenses sometimes subsidized. Government does this in many sectors, but the most subsidized sector is the fossil fuel sector. Um, more terms that we're going to talk about. So here's the thing. You get all these high paying jobs when the fossil fuel industry um, enters an area. Happens in, it's happening in Canada. But what happens when the cost of oil, for example, or the cost of petroleum goes goes down and your energy return on investment gets too low and it becomes inefficient or too expensive for you to extract a fuel, um, the business dries up and that happens all the time. Uh, a lot of times the oil producing nations will drop their price of oil specifically to crush certain sectors um, around the world. So as oil shale booms in the United States, the cost of oil comes down. So the OPEC nations, and we'll talk about what they are in a second, they come into play. They drop their price so low that it becomes too expensive to produce 
um, oil shale, and therefore all of a sudden you start buying oil from them, and, and, and your uh, your businesses, your business model dries up. The jobs are gone. What do governments do um, to basically take property from people? In a sense, they, there's a term called eminent domain. What they do is they can you own property, and you, let's just say it's your home. The government can come in and say, hey, we need this land. We need to build a freeway. It's going to be for the public good. And you don't have a choice. They're going to buy it from you at, at market value. You may not want to sell, but they're going to buy it from, from you at market value at that particular moment. Um, they do this all the time. It's, it's, not, it's a shady practice used by the government. I know here in San Diego, in downtown, as they develop downtown San Diego, they use the eminent domain to take people's properties downtown so they can build the baseball park. Apparently, that baseball park was considered for public good somehow, and they took people's businesses or properties or homes as a result of it. Downtown San Diego, I know they've used eminent domain to take um, people's properties because they wanted to build a hotel. Go figure. How would a hotel be public good? Well, I'll tell you how it would be considered public good. Hotels bring a lot of tax money. So the government says we have you know a business here that only pays so much in taxes. We can put hundreds of rooms in a hotel here, and there each room is going to pay taxes. So eminent domain is used in some ways, in, in shady ways, to take people's property. So what happened? Let's talk about dependence on foreign energy. This is a common uh, term that comes up. Um, with the United States, and we we use so much fossil fuels, we use so much petroleum, especially our car vehicles, the way we, you know, just the way we get around in our country, that we have a dependence on foreign energy. We cannot produce enough of our own energy here. That's a problem. The U.S. needs to break that problem, and by breaking that problem, they would have to get into renewable energy use because we, we, what we have in the U.S. in regards to fossil fuels is we have a lot of coal. But most people are shifting away from coal because coal burns the least clean. The cleanest burning fuel, I should have mentioned earlier in the lecture, is a natural gas. Gases burn the cleanest. They have the least amount of carbon dioxide emissions. They have very little, if any, sulfur emissions, very little, if any, mercury emissions. They do have nitrogen oxide emissions, but they do have less than oil, for example, or less than coal. So the cleanest burning fuel is natural gas, but it still releases carbon dioxide. So clean just means it it's, it's, has less of those emissions as compared to the others. Um, the United States relies on petroleum big time. So what happened in 1973? In 1973, the U.S. was in support of Israel during a, a crisis happening in the Middle East. Well, Israel is a Jewish nation, and OPEC is and was primarily the Middle Eastern countries, and they got angry at the U.S. for siding with Israel on something, so they decided to reduce the supply of oil to the United States. By reducing the supply of oil in the United States, it increased the price of oil in the United States. So people freaked out. Oil became expensive. Car, you know, just to drive around became extremely expensive. So what did the U.S. do? Well, they figured out we got to develop we got to get some new partners in this. So currently, most of our oil that we get here in the United States, it comes from Canada. This might be an old chart. I don't know if it's still. This is a, this is a, this is a couple few years old based on your book. I believe Canada is number one. I believe our number two is probably Mexico now. I think the Saudis might be three or four. Ecuador's in there and Venezuela's in there somewhere, but I don't know if it, I believe it's Canada and now Mexico. So what did the U.S. do? They started supporting oil sands extraction. That happened in Canada. They're also currently supporting the, the shale oil industry happening here in the United States. Um, in the U.S., you'll hear about this all the time. You need to be aware of it. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up in Alaska. Why is that important? Well, because there's oil deposits there, petroleum deposits there. And it's a constant debate depending on whether Republicans or Democrats are in charge of what's happening. The debate is they want to open ANWR or the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up for oil drilling because of the reserves that are potentially there and the amount of oil that's there. So it's a constant debate on whether it should happen or it shouldn't happen. So be aware of that. Okay, Energy efficiency versus conservation. Well, 
appliances are becoming more efficient, um, which means you're getting more output with less energy input. That's what energy efficiency means. A lot of people have like an old refrigerator at their house. And what they don't realize is that old refrigerator is so inefficient that the energy cost that they're spending just to keep it running all month, they can actually have a brand new refrigerator. A lot of people don't really realize that because of that's how expensive uh, the cost of electricity gets. Energy conser- conservation is like you know turning off your lights when you leave a room or not, not having things plugged in all the time, just using less energy in general. All right, cogeneration. Well, they're saying, hey, um, there's a lot of excess heat produced during electricity production. And remember, how do you produce electricity? You set a fossil fuel on fire. There's a review. That, that fire, you've got you to catch fire to a fossil fuel, which takes water and boils the water and converts it to steam. The steam now under that high pressure and motion can spin turbines, okay, which will eventually spin the generator, which will convert, which will move magnets around copper wire creating electricity. Well, there's a lot of heat in that process. And that heat, the hope is to take some of it and turn it into uh, heat that you can heat workplaces or other areas nearby. Uh, other ways of ha- making your home more efficient. Insulation is a huge one or better design. And better design would be like having your house facing south in the, in, in the United States so that you can take advantage of sunlight, um, lighting up your house and heating up your house. Um, for insulation, this shows you a picture here. This shows you four homes. The reddish or orangish color means heat loss. You notice how three of them are green. They all have reddish colors and orange colors in their windows because they're all losing heat in their windows. This one here is not insulated. This not insulated home or uninsulated home is losing a lot of heat. So therefore, it requires a lot more energy to maintain a, a temperature that's comfortable. These three are insulated, so they're not losing their heat. This one is not insulated, so it is losing its heat. So a real smart thing to do is insulate your home. You'll need much less energy to keep your home warm or cool, for that matter. All right. Um, there's this Energy Star program. Appliances are rated in a certain way, just to let you know that's a common thing. They say to unplug things that are that are at home. Why things will will take energy even though they're not being used. Okay, so different ways of being efficient and conserving. And we'll stop there.